many, many people in this world are recommending randomized placebo controlled trials. As you, Do you remember, heard. Jean Pierre, you remember there was a, a randomized controlled trial of parachutes published in a British medical journal. Parachutes that would open and parachutes that wouldn't open. And they did the trial, but they couldn't get anyone recruited for the placebo parachute. So they had to park the aircraft on the ground. But it was just to laugh from such uneducated brains that would think that everything requires randomized controlled trials. And it doesn't. There's a whole list of conditions where RCTs are inappropriate. So they should go back and read and maybe do medicine all over again. So what has been the response from general practitioners in Australia? Because you, you, you were, I don't know how you did it, but you were able to reach out in uh, the national media, which, which is very unprecedented, I think, in the industrialized world, uh, maybe in France a bit, but uh, in, in the US, in Canada, medical doctors don't have the ability to voice their opinion. Oh, I, I think we should treat people early. Uh, so, what has been the response of general practitioners? Well, it was slow at first, but as soon as some started treating, the others are taking up and running with it. But it has been slow, but uh, currently it's gaining momentum. Okay. So, from your perspective, what is the role of randomized uh, controlled research in this context, given that you are treating people, you are going to, to, to do an observational study, use uh, historical data to compare. What, what is the role of, of these uh, randomized controlled trials in this context? Well, you may have noticed that we're using a combination of therapies that is known to cure the condition from publications. In fact, there is no publication that has shown failure to, to markedly improve. But the randomized trials should be reserved for hospitals when you are comparing one steroid to another. A single drug versus a single drug in a patient where there are alternative single drugs. But if you have something that cures somebody, you cannot compare it with a placebo or a drug that doesn't cure it. I think that's very difficult to get an ethics committee to approve that. Well, you know that in Europe, the discovery trial, the, the recovery trial in the UK uh, had huge numbers of, um, of uh, placebo uh, controlled patients and uh, we didn't really know, I think, what they were venturing in and they had uh, hospital mortality rates of about 25%. And um, uh, but we are talking about thousands of people, so so there are different schools and uh, obviously no. very different no. approaches. If you read the papers, they were done in hospitalized patients, and that's a big difference. And so, if you're in a hospitalized patient, there are alternative therapies. For example, Math Plus, M A T H Plus therapy is an alternative treatment. The second point you made, which is very clear that there were mortalities, correct? Yeah. Well, that is the point I'm making. Whoever carries out such a trial should no longer be practicing medicine. Okay. I, but do you um, know what, I'm trying, what the conclusion of that is? The conclusion is that if they designed such a trial and there were deaths, tell me who's responsible for the deaths? There were thousands of deaths in the case of the UK trial and uh, and the recovery, sorry, the, the discovery trial. Uh, I had an interview with Professor Perron uh, he told, and he mentioned it didn't go anywhere either. And uh, these, tr these, these, uh, these trials were led to a lot of death and uh, yes. uh, I, I wrote myself uh, articles back in March analyzing these um, um, this trial, and I give you an example. I, when the, the protocol of the recovery trial was announced, there was there were several arms, but one arm was uh, hydroxychloroquine, another arm was azithromycin, and I said, "What the heck? Why don't they combine like uh, uh, it was already 
announced and uh, known from the research in France that it is that that there are signs that uh, that it is working. And uh, I, I wrote an article stating exactly that. I wrote I sent it to Professor Orby. Our guest uh, discussed it and uh, basically continued with their approach. And uh, over 1,000 deaths uh, uh, later, uh, they said, oh, hydroxychloroquine does not work. And then there is controversy about the dosage, etc. cetera, they use. But, uh, t so there is a very sad history of research, uh, um, mm -hmm. randomized research. Uh, that is so, that is just so um, have, a few weeks you old. You have confirmed that we are both thinking the same thing. Firstly, for a viral infection, do you know any viral disease where a single drug should be used? And the answer is no. So the fault lies with the designers. Secondly, if we do Crohn's trials, we just finished a very large one of 331 patients, international. Was there a placebo arm? No, no ethics will approve in Crohn's disease. It's not a dying disease. Rarely people die, yet they must have current standard of care therapy. Whereas in coronavirus, there is no standard of care therapy. It is a no therapy. So you need to start thinking, well, what kind of trial shall we design? Well, it should be a whole combination of drugs like in hepatitis C or hepatitis B. If there was a single drug that could kill a virus, I would un be understanding that we wouldn't be talking today because there will be no more coronavirus. But you need to combine multiples and not compare azithromycin to clarithromycin to intravenous carrot juice. So, so how do the, the Australian authorities at the state level, at the federal levels, uh, react? Because I understand that there is uh, skepticism, but you have also some support. How, how is it uh, evolving? Well, the drugs in Australia are all approved singly, separately, drugs by our approval process, which is the TGA, as they are by the FDA. So we are simply suggesting that doctors write off-label combination medication and they know what the publications are that say that it works 92 to 100 percent. And there's been no real pushback, although, you know, it's very hard to get someone to stand up and say, we should all be treating patients with this combination. That will come later when we start seeing how well patients are doing in the aged care facilities, how elderly patients with multiple co comorbidities can do well, then I think it'll get more momentum, which is what we're seeing already. But in terms of the alternative politicized view of the other drug that's been out on the market as well for arthritis, there's not been that support. And I, I'm more for Ivermectin with 3.7 billion uses around the world and I don't recall any deaths yet we see deaths from aspirin we see deaths from from paracetamol overdoses and so forth but do you see what I'm saying it's an extremely safe rapid to cure combination that one must use a combination not a single drug and it has to be used as early as you can. So, so what do you expect from the state authorities or the federal authorities in, in Australia? I think we'll get a wow. We, we can now meet for Christmas. We only have 1,700 infected and 30,000 doctors. I think it won't be very hard to cure everybody as the momentum gains. That's what I would like to achieve. I'm there to treat the patients. I have no financial interest in this, but I think you would do the same if you were here. So do you have any message you would like to voice uh, to those uh, the, uh, with, you know, governmental officials and, and others in countries where there is a policy uh, not to treat early? Uh, Canada is a prime example, uh, but you have many other countries where early treatment is not on the table. 
Well, I would ask that those who are allowed to speak on a topic and, and give uh, support should, the word is encourage, every doctor to practice his own patient-doctor relationship and prescribe medications which are legally prescribable off-label to save lives. And I think anyone in his right mind would say the same thing. And ultimately, those in power, they come looking for treatment when their loved ones get sick, let me tell you. I understand you, you, you have uh, asked people to, to, to write to your center to get the details of your protocol. Does that apply for, for people from outside Australia? Well, we respond to doctors. There's, there are interested parties who are not medical. And so we really are limiting this to, um, to doctors who, who can email us on gp at cdd.com.au and they'll be able to obtain through one step the method to treat the protocol. This was designed for Australia, as you can imagine, because we're not thinking, we were not thinking at this stage that we'll be speaking with you and with the whole world. Um, but I, I'm sure that if they make a case, we'll be able to send them the protocol. Okay, do you have any comments, suggestions you would like to make before the interview ends? Well, I think if we all work together, we follow the laws of off-label prescribing of approved drugs. And if we remain responsible to our patients, which is what we're here for as doctors, then I think we can terminate this pandemic and we can fly again, if that's what you want to do. Well, I have to thank you so much and uh, I'm pretty sure your message will attract a lot of inter attention. I think that uh, it's not only a medical message, but it's a very positive message that is that is very focused on what matters. And uh, so I have to, to thank you again for your time. Thank you very, very much for taking the effort. Thank you. You're welcome.